Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, lovely people arriving. If you could um, write your name in the chat and the organisation that you work for, if you've got one and it's relevant, uh, where in the country you are and any outdoor arts that, uh, that, or events that you know have happened or you're planning to make happen. That's, that's your homework while we wait. So waiting on a few people who registered, so I'll keep letting people in. All right, letting you know. Yeah, great. Thank you. Well, let's just give it a couple of moments as people arrive. Those of you who are here already, please do write your name and what you're doing in the chat. Alright, your typing's very loud. Is it? Oh god, I'm really sorry. <laughs> you might want to mute while you're typing. <laughs> I'm not going to do any more. No, sorry. I was wondering who to mute. I was meeting people down the column. I wasn't sure who it was. <laughs> it was me, sorry. <laughs> See that intent look. <laughs> Should you give it one more minute and then start? Yeah, yeah. People just keep, people are keeping joining in, so. I think we should maybe start. What do you think, Erica? Yeah, I'll just let people um, in as and when, once people are speaking, if that's useful. So Yeah, why, do, why don't you do hello and I'll let people in and then you can hand over to me and we swap. Okay, excellent. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's lovely to see um, everyone and lovely to hear who's on the call and just in the chat from all over the place. So um, great to have you here in our, um, in our outdoor arts call. Um, just as a bit of context, this is... Um, um, from the West Midlands Culture Response Unit, which has been a, um, a sector-led um, support really for, this, for the West Midlands sector around um, the recovery, visibility and the viability um, in the region. Um, we identified with ORIT and um, the Outdoor Working Group um, um, a few months ago the need for support around outdoor events and um, supporting people to put on them in the light of the restriction with COVID and the fact that outdoor events were um, safer um, in, the, in that period of time. Um, and thought that would be really useful to share. So 
Thank you to all of our speakers who have given their time and, and resource to think about this and to share their amazing expertise. It's, um, it's great to have everyone on the call. Um, and also, um, yeah, it's interesting just with the backdrop yesterday, obviously, you know, more, more restrictions announced and, and, um, and, and for over a longer period of time, it would seem. Um, nothing specifically stopping outdoor, outdoor events and I think that's what we have to hold on to and I think a lot of this work is around how we demonstrate safety um, as we go through um, this, this kind of quite long period and, and the value of having our work outdoors not only just for the um, economy of our places and the, the feel of our towns and cities and high streets um, but also an experience for the people who need it so much at the moment and where arts and culture plays a massive significant role in mental health well-being and just enjoyment um, at such a challenging time so hopefully despite the fact that it does you know it, it feels very challenging and um, um, and recognizing that and organizations and individuals are facing some difficult conversations hopefully by doing this kind of thing we can move forward together and um, and yeah do what we do well so I'm going to hand over to you now Ari, if that's okay. Thank you yeah thanks hello um, everybody my name's Orit Azaz and I'm a independent theatre maker and artistic director I've been mainly working outdoors for the last um, 10 or 12 years um, and um, like, uh, like all of you, um, I feel passionately um, about um, arts and culture, about making things happen in these difficult moments. And, um, and uh, rec recognised um, along with uh, Erica and Lou Lomas and Graham Callister, our co-hosts who are board members of Outdoor Arts UK and also based in the Midlands, that um, it's a good moment for us to say outdoor arts is a thing in the UK and in the West Midlands region, um, that there's a great wealth of expertise in terms of producers, artists, programmers, production managers, uh, local, um, local authority representatives and bids um, who, who have been working together over a really long period of time to create a community of interest and practice. And it's a good moment perhaps for us to mobilize ourselves in support of the wider sector. Um, we hosted a similar event to this at the start of August to begin to share those experiences of uh, working in um, public and private spaces outdoors and together consider what we need to make it work. What are the differences between venue based work and outdoors and to share our emerging understanding of the knowns and unknowns in relation to our um, COVID-19 context um, now updated. Thanks, Erica. And, uh, and everyone who's going to speak here today is going to be very open about where they're at and what they're thinking. And the only reason we persuaded them to come here and do that is by assuring them that everyone will be very supportive and warm. Um, so please use the chat to be supportive and warm. Um, but also use the chat to uh, ask any questions that you have and between us and in fact, everyone who's here, let's try to give answers to the questions that, uh, that people raise in the chat. It's a really, really important part of the session that we're yeah. going to experience. Somebody's got a noisy background, and I'm hoping that this time it's not my typing. Thanks, Erica. So um, listen, the purpose of today's event, to which you are very, very warmly welcome, is to respond to some of the questions and themes arising from our previous conversation on the 4th of August and also from our recent experiences of working outdoors um, and to continue to provide practical support and inspiration especially in relation to events that might happen in uh, in the autumn winter or now probably early spring when the weather is not so great and uh, and we need to be real about uh, how those things are going to work so uh, we're going to have um, a number of we've invited a number of people to speak today um, in a moment, uh, or at some point, I think that she is tangled up elsewhere, uh, Lou Lomas, who's an independent producer and Outdoor Arts UK member, is going to give us a bit of an overview of what's been happening over the last month. And then um, Rosie Clements and Matt Evans from Birmingham Hippodrome are going to talk about their recent experiences at the Bullring in Birmingham, followed by Philip Across from Talking Birds. Uh, also talking about being involved in the Bullring event and presenting the Walk With Me audio tour experience in Coventry. And then Louise Richards from Motion House, you're going to talk about your experience of working outdoors in winter, but also give us a general view of what's happening in your world uh, and how you're thinking about planning outdoor work. 
And then Chris Woodford and Caroline Davis, Chris from Logistical Safety and Caroline from Opus, you're going to talk about technical and safety perspectives of event organising and all those budget lines that we need to be adding and thinking about um, as we plan work that happens outdoors in our current context. And then Gemma Thomas from Appetite in Stoke and Richard Buxton from Stoke City Centre Bid, you're going to talk about the events that you're planning and the bid perspective in terms of what city centres are looking for in these times. And um, listen, we should say up front, we met just before this began um, to, to, uh, to think about the news, um, the new guidelines and rules that were announced yesterday. And although it's not uh, uh, the work that we may be planning has not been completely banned, uh, it's still open. Um, it's clear that there are going to be increased restrictions over the coming weeks. And our feeling is that all of us are going to be planning to be doing arts and cultural events outdoors and in unusual and on uh, uh, contexts over the next six months and maybe 12 months. And so we really hope that everything that's shared today is going to be useful to you in some way, even if it's not in quite the short term that you might have imagined it. As I say, please, please write your questions in the chat. Let's have a very lively discussion there and, um, and uh, please feel very, very welcome. Um, if we have time, um, and we really hope we will, we'll have some um, Q&A, either we'll respond to questions in the chat or, um, or we can um, unmute. Let's deal with that when we get there. And if we're feeling exhausted, we can have a little break too. Our final end aim is 3.45 at the very latest. Um, I appreciate that some people might need to go before that. And if you do, please leave some, leave some feedback before you go. Um, I want to just um, share, uh, share a postcard from elsewhere before I hand over um, to next speakers. So um, you may or may not know this, um, but between the 28th of August and the 12th of September, Greenwich and Docklands International Festival put on over 150 shows for 20,000 socially distanced audience members spread across 19 different locations in the Royal Borough of Greenwich and East London working with 10 partners. They had 120 volunteers and 50 participants who gave their time to support the festival and make the audience experience safe and enjoyable. And as the first full live arts festival to take place in the UK after lockdown, the learning that they have seems absolutely uh, gold dust to all of us. So of course we rang them and invited them to come and speak today. But as luck would have it, today is their full team evaluation meeting. And so I spoke with um, the festival producer, Ellie Harris. I told her about the themes that we were particularly interested in. Um, from our last uh, webinar, ticketing, live streaming, what did you do to influence decision makers, um, what did you learn, and what can we, uh, what can we borrow from you? And, um, and she was very generous with, uh, with giving me some answers to that. So number one, I wanted to raise the flag at this moment and we'll share the link. It's really worth going to have a look at their website look at their ticketing and visitors information because they really, really worked hard to make their audiences feel safe and to be very clear in their communications about the kind of experience that they could expect and how to access it. Um, so I, I thoroughly recommend going to have a look. Um, they will be sharing their evaluation as soon as, um, as, as they've finished uh, their meeting, you know, or thinking about it so that we, we can all benefit from their learning. And if there's time at the end, I'll cover the key points that, um, that Ellie shared with me um, in terms of their learning or pick up anything that hasn't been answered so far. Um, what I did just want to share at this point is they said that, that she said that the single thing that they did that was massively different to their previous 25 years of experience of organizing free outdoor, um, outdoor uh, arts and cultural events in that part of London was that they engaged a health and safety consultant to work with them to supplement their experience and be the cheerleader for um, what was needed. I mean, the cheerleader and the whipcracker, I assume. Um, and, uh, and that person worked with them to, on their, from the very, very beginning to think about, to risk assess, to figure out the additional budgets that they would require the, that person did a site sign off on every one of the nine sites every day before they went ahead, supervised the signage and just brought that kind of 
um, both extra capacity, extra brain processing, and extra um, reassurance, I guess, both to the team and the artists and the audiences and their funders and stakeholders. And so um, I'm really delighted um, that, um, uh, that today um, we've got Chris Woodford, who um, I guess, Chris, that you've played a similar role in relation to the events that you've been part of and are part of. And uh, so I'm hoping that you can pick up on that thread. So um, that's really, uh, I felt very, very encouraged to know that they went ahead. It was a huge success. They had fantastic audience feedback. They were sold out. They managed audiences who arrived by advanced ticketing, but also uh, walk up. Um, they really found lots and lots of solutions to some to the questions that we all have. So um, that's brilliant to know that they went ahead. And I thought I would just share that postcard from Ellie. She really wanted to come and speak in person, but um, she had to go and do their thing. So without further ado, I think um, that we should pass on to the next person. What I can't do is see if Lou is here. Erica, can you see? She's not. She's not. I know that she had to go and do something. She had to deal with um, a bit of a, um, a, 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 a an emergency matter. Um, I think we'll invite her to speak when she does get here. Lou is a board member of Outdoor Arts UK and um, and she will be able to share with you what support the organisation Outdoor Arts UK can offer to all of you, to all of us, what they have on their website uh, and what's been happening over the last few weeks and months. So we'll squeeze Lou, Lou in when she arrives. And meanwhile, I'd like to hand over, if I may, to um, Rosie and Matt. Over to you to introduce yourselves. And Thank you very much. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Matt Evans from um, Hippodrome, um, I'm Festival Production Coordinator um, and yeah, so I work on the festivals team um, there and we've been delivering Project Joy um, with the Bullwing and Grand Central um, so I'll hand over to Rosie just to introduce herself. Hi everyone, um, I'm Rosie, I'm a freelance producer based in Birmingham specialising in outdoor arts and festivals um, and I uh, was working with the Hippodrome on Project Joy. Great, thank you. Um, so yeah, so Project Joy um, was, um, well, is a partnership between Birmingham Joy Festivals and Boring and Grand Central, um, bringing pockets of joy and making people smile, bringing life to the centre um, and live activity back to Boring and Grand Central as part of our partnership um, with them to deliver live activity within the centre, um, reinforcing the positive message of social distancing and making people smile in times that are quite hard. Um, as you can understand, um, and then use, using a combination of local and national artists from the touring arts scene, outdoor arts catalogue, uh, without walls catalogue, and everything like that. Um, so I'll go on to, yeah, so key considerations that we had to deal with um, when planning Project Joy um, is adapting to the guidance, the big thing, um, it seems to change daily. Um, so I think we're on, for, for the first event we did in August, um, I think we're on about version 10 or maybe maybe 12 of, of the event manual. Um, so yeah, ch change on a daily basis, but working with all the agencies in, in the safety advisory group in Birmingham to come to a, uh, a delivery method that works for, for everyone. And then complying with the Bourbon and Grand Central regulations and the shopping centre guidance, everything like that as well, as all the um, outdoor arts guidance and performing arts guidance. Um, in terms of that guidance, it's about risk assessments, um, event manuals, being COVID secure and whatever that means. Um, and yeah, there's, there's a lot of people that can advise on what, what that is and how that then works. Um, putting in track and trace systems would have been a big thing for us and getting a robust system in place. Um, we used online forms um, and were able to audit all of our staff before they came on site. We track, track and trace, get all their details, and then also temperature check them on site, check them in on site, track where they were, who they were interacting with, um, and everything like that. And also including the vulnerability assessments, which isn't thought about quite often for the staff, um, about whether they are actually vulnerable more than more than other staff, and taking that into account when planning that event. Um, and then so and then social distancing, um, <laughs> one meter, two meters, uh, one meter with a mask, however that is. Um, and use of face coverings throughout that um, and then there's the cleaning and sanitization as well as part of that that's just, just a standard thing for everyone now 
Um, and I suppose so bubble working, um, we, were, we made bubbles of cohorts um, working on the event, meaning we had to have a, a lot of extra staff in to work on that, that we'd normally, we wouldn't normally have that. It can go across um, different, different artists, different staff, but we had to have specific staff for each artist, for each, for each thing, but making sure we got crowd management plans in place for security, um, forming like yeah, the, the bubbles with the security and the artists on that, on that front. Um, and in case of crowds forming, ways to deal with that and show stop the performances to then um, deal with those crowds and disperse those crowds and working with the boring to kind of manage that those crowds as well. And then yeah, local authority liaison as well. Um, yeah, we had a SAG for this, we had no a SAG meeting for this and um, yeah, it was, it was one of the most over scrutinized events I think, because it was one of the first um, public realm events in Birmingham, um, at just open, open uh, public. So. Um, yeah, we had a lot to deal with on that front. Um, yeah, so as I said, the first event took place on Wednesday, 26th of August, um, enabled us to pilot pilot the events and see how, how they were taken, how, the, how they were receptive by the public. And so we can respond to that for the future events as part of this programme across September and October and November. Um, using a mix of local and national artists for this event, we did end up with 75% local artists. So in case of a local lockdown, we thought, well, we try not to use everyone nationally um, from all around the country because some areas might be like locked down. Um, we use 75% from the West Midlands. There's 25% national, but I think they had quite a good split on that front um, to deal with that and to come across that. We didn't have any issues on that. Um, but obviously, it could, it could have been worse like it is now. Um, and like we're trying to plan for the next ones. Um, I've got to the next one. So we, um, each performance, we have three different artists as part of the 26th of um, August event. Um, it was a street theatre and comedy theme. Um, so it was all Roman acts around the outside areas of Ball Ring. Um, each one had a security guard and a COVID marshal with them. Um, it's a new role for us. Um, which Boris then announced two weeks later. So it's just standard, standard way, isn't it? Um, but yeah, um, so we utilised freelancers for those COVID marshals roles, mix of stage managers, um, event producers, event production managers, um, who are who are out of work. Um, and we use those as they've got experience in show stopping, in the ASM event management, in running events. And it's a really good role to have, a really good person to have in that role um, for that. Um, so going to the uh, yeah the the acts we had, they had the lifeguards, which you probably all are aware of. We've probably all seen them lots of times on beaches and festivals around the country. Um, but yes, yeah, so they're, they're really good. Perched on high chairs, barriers around them, um, using battery microphones, uh, megaphones, um, trying to interact with the crowds as they went past. There wasn't many crowds, but interacting with the members of the public, and it was really well received. And there's a lot of there's a lot of laughing. There's a lot of um, a lot of good reception from them um, from on that front. They, they weren't enforcing social distancing, so that was a, a big thing we were saying, well, do we change our act to be a social distancing li lifeguards? Um, but it, 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 it just wasn't. It was, it was keeping their normal act, keeping it as it was, and it was really well receptive, and it just take, took a distraction from that. Um, next one was Susan, the social distancing robot, <laughs> a really good act for this year. Um, and yeah, roaming around the outside areas of boring, and interacting with kids, dancing with them, singing with them, any, or adults as well. Um, anyone who are really good to um, really good interactions at a social distance that remote controlled um, doesn't have to have an operator anywhere near. But it's making sure there's still a steward near to to combat that and the contingencies in place for if someone does touch it, what do we do then? Cleaning it and everything like that. Um, and then we had the queue. I don't know, Rosie, do you want to talk a bit on the queue because Rosie was the COVID marshal with the queue. Um, so I hand it to you, Rosie. Yep, um, so we had the queue um, by Torf and Birds, and I think Philippa will say a couple more things about it. Um, but one, the main thing I wanted to say, which was, which may have changed since the latest guidelines, was that my experience was that it was so well received, all, all by members of the public, by um, the staff at Boring, and by the artists, and anyone we came across. We didn't have a single comment um, that was negative. Um, so that's just something I wanted to share that actually it was really, really positive experience and um, really worthwhile do doing, excuse me. Um, there's a lot of things you've got to do to make things happen 
at the moment but for me I just want to say how worth it was um, and it was great to have some work again so um, from a freelance perspective if you do need um, anyone to do something like a COVID martial role it, I think that's really beneficial thanks great um, yeah so it would be really good to have Rosie on board as, as that producer in that role um, with the experience that she had um, and yeah, so it was successful that event was, the 26th of August, four weeks ago, no cases arisen, there's no test and trace um, contacts or anything like that needed, um, which was quite good. Um, Hamilton's group, who are the commercial operators of the ball ring, um, did comment to the ball ring management that it was one of the most positive messages of social distancing that they'd seen across their shopping centres, um, bringing the performance element into it. Um, and there's some pictures there of, of, of the day on the bottom of that slide. Um, and yeah, so they were really pleased and, and really well received. And yeah, it's planning for the next the next ones in that series of events, depending on these new restrictions and what that will then mean. Um, and yeah, yeah. So and, but, and then in terms of the rest of the festivals team working with Coventry City of Culture as well, in a couple of weeks uh, in, well, across the next couple of weeks and months to deliver something at the end of November, hopefully in Coventry. So that could be something quite good as well. But yeah, dependent on these new restrictions and what that will be. I hope I've squeezed enough in there into those eight minutes of it. You've done an absolutely brilliant job, Matt. Thank you very much. And thanks, Rosie, too. Um, you've done brilliantly well. Um, and great to hear about Project Joy. Now, if you could turn your attention to the chat, then some people have got questions for you there, so you can respond to those. And meanwhile, it's a good moment to hand over to Philippa Cross from Talking Birds. Going to attempt to share my screen here. Bear with me. Please. Have you got that? Yeah. Great. Okay, so um, Talking Birds does a lot of work in unusual spaces um, and outdoor arts. We have quite a big outdoor portfolio, four or five shows. And on the 23rd of March, every gig we had booked for the summer was cancelled or possibly postponed, thanks to Lou, who does our tour booking, Lou Lomas, has managed to talk to some people about postponing it for a year. So that's a little bit of silver lining. Uh, this is the whale, which swallows its audience one at a time or two if you're shy for an intimate tale, pun yeah, intended. Uh, the performer sits at the back here um, in this little bit and the audience go in here. It's a lovely, small, intimate space, enclosed, not great ventilation. That one's out. Um, the Oakmobile, which is the whale's big little sister brother, um, a, a similar thing, a bigger space, uh, but as you can see, it's a space where people crowd in for um, an intimate tale, about eight to 10 people there. And people queue for these things for unbelievably long times. Um, so uh, yeah, two small enclosed spaces, right, we better think again. How about the cricketers? We love the cricketers. This is, the bottom picture is actually quite near to the Hippodrome. It was, uh, they gave us it, its first outing a few years ago and, and, and in Cannon Hill Park there. Cricketers is great, outdoor, lots of space, but actually people gather in. Uh, we encourage people to join in playing a game of cricket throwing and catching a ball and wearing cricket pads and cricket hats, all those things that other people have just touched. Yeah, that one's out. So uh, we were left with one show that we thought might work, which was the queue. And uh, this is the queue normally. So um, uh, yeah, queuing up to handle a snake. That's always a good one, a musical queue. And on the right, the, uh, down at the South Bank, that's a Quelfy queue. So everyone taking their, their selfie, Quelfy. Uh, this normally is about making cues. It was commissioned originally for the Cultural Olympia to celebrate the great British sport of queuing, just in case we didn't win any other Olympic medals. We could definitely win this. Uh, commenting on queue etiquette. Uh, but cues, we're not we don't really want people close together. But the queue is a really adaptable show. Our performers improvise. They respond to what's going on. They create new things. So this one definitely had legs. Uh, but we had to think about focusing more on social distancing. So what better than some enormous orange hoops, which the fantastic Vortex Creates in Coventry made for us to demonstrate two meters distance. Uh, so this was a lot of fun, quite difficult to get through the doors into the ball ring, but great for outdoors. Um, we made it about celebrating responsible queuing. We had visors on hand and uh, we had some masks just in case. 
we updated our risk assessment and I have to say it was brilliant that a lot of stuff was being done by the Hippodrome think about that and thank you Rosie it was brilliant having you there having a friendly face and you know that someone else is on it as well as you was really really great um, we had hand sanitizer for performers we paid our performers a little bit more because they were this was the first time they went out and that's a bit risky actually you know it was quite early and so we kind of recognized that we said let's just bump that up a little bit um, so um, also it was a very quick turnaround so it sort of responded to that everyone had a lot of fun the staff were so happy to have done that the performers were all fed back how brilliant it was to do that um, in terms of the risk assessment the main thing john hogan spoke to us last time and he said don't transmit the virus what can you do to stop transmission of the virus and adhere to social distancing that was our mantra throughout Walk With Me is an, uh, the other show that we were making at the time of lockdown. So Walk With Me is a series of audio tours around neighbourhoods in Coventry. And uh, it's led by a performer. You can see that in green there, Adea. Um, and on the left, you will see, I, I hope, I didn't, unless it's mirrored for you, the one at the top. Um, that was before lockdown when we did it last year. You can see how everyone's crowded around her to listen in. We reduced the audience from 20 to 10 people and we ask them to stand in their separate bubbles or on their own as they came um, it's an audio tour it's got headphones so it was really suitable for social distancing you can actually be quite a long away away from that performer uh, without losing any kind of contact with her you're hearing it all there's a lot of sounds that you're hearing not just her voice but sounds you're listening into sounds from the past so that was brilliant um, we usually meet at Print Manufactory for this tour, which is in the back corner to the right of Twisted Barrel, uh, if, unless it's mirrored, those doors. But um, it's a, we, we tend to, we gather there and then afterwards we go back for evaluation and a chat and we get people's stories about the area. We have, we have tea and uh, I even make God cakes, which, which get a mention on the tour and we share those. I didn't want to do catering for this tour, I have to say. I didn't want to be responsible for making stuff that people were eating during this time. In fact, we moved to the box. So this is um, just across the way at Fargo. And I know Lucy's here. Thank you, Lucy, and all the Fargo team. Very supportive. Um, it has a big barn door type thing, which we could keep open uh, whilst we were using it. So really good ventilation. We laid people's uh, headphones out on the tables together with their mats and the evaluation. They had one table they went to in their group and they came back to that one afterwards. We sanitised the headphones between use. I even sanitised those pens. On the walk, um, the, a walk by its nature, you can spread out. Um, so you can see on, on the, the one along by the canal, they were here along the, the railings. And we have stewards with their walk with me, the high vis. Amazing what you can do when you're wearing a high vis, as I'm sure many of you know. It did help to make it look a bit official. It helped us if people were in the way just to ask if they wouldn't mind stepping to the side to let the group go through. Um, and on the, the picture in the park, I wanted to show this because actually it was really relaxed. People really enjoyed it, felt they were in control of how far they could be apart from other people. So they had some, some agency over that, which I think was important. Um, so uh, we did keep reminding people to spread out when we paused at particular places so again at the top picture that's on the previous tours the bottom picture much more spread out so our performer built that into bits of the script we put a bit of extra rehearsal time in so we could look at where the pinch points were and we could work out what we needed to do if we needed to stand in a different place when we paused so that was a really useful thing to do. We also shared with our audience in advance what our COVID precautions were. We put it all on our website. In an email, we, we, we gave a summary of it, but um, if people wanted to know more, they could go to that. You'll see some people are wearing masks. We, we wore what masks and we invited the people to do so. We didn't insist, most people did. Um, and sometimes they go, oh, I didn't think to bring a mask. We just reassured them. One thing we were really conscious of was that we needed to be calm. We needed to show people that it was all okay, that we could do this and it was fine. And I think that was a really important thing. And then uh, final slide here. So this is our finale in a park with an amazing bit of local history, which I didn't know about at all. I drove past this park for years without knowing this. You see, um, normally they would have been much closer in around that inner circle, but to protect our performer, again in the script, we, she asked them to spread out in a wide circle. So one of the things we had at the forefront of our mind was how are we going to keep our staff safe throughout this? Um, for their obviously for their own health and because this is a single performer that can do this you know it's really important both for us and for them that they're kept safe 
Um, so I'm going to stop there because I think that's probably coming up on my eight minutes, um, but happy to answer stuff in the chat. Thanks so much, Philippa. It's um, brilliant to hear about your experiences and thank you for being so generous um, with, your, uh, with your tale. Um, ask questions of Philippa in the chat and I'm very glad to introduce Louise Richards from Motion House. Um, hi, everybody. Um, sorry, I've got a strange view, so I'm just checking you can see me. Um, I'm mainly going to be talking about um, outdoor performances in the winter, um, but just a very quick sort of summary about who I am, who Motion House is, if you don't know who we are, and what we're doing in general terms at the moment in order to continue to deliver our work. Um, exactly the same as what Philippa described at the end of March, we lost all of our outdoor touring. We were set to be fielding three different companies running eight different shows in rep with three teams touring in parallel so as you can imagine it was a pretty devastating situation to find ourselves in um, as we unusually for companies of our size employ our performers um, they've all been on furlough ever since and that has meant that we actually haven't been able to respond as fluidly as we might have liked to to some of the opportunities out there but what that has meant is we've been really thinking about what we as a company do moving ahead um, we do both outdoor and indoor performances. That's what we're known for. Everything from tiny scale through to very large scale outdoor work. Um, and the thing that we're known for is our dance circus techniques. We are a highly physical company. We work on sets. So it's, you know, at first glance, a COVID nightmare. Our work involves touching each other, lifting each other, throwing each other around and clambering all over sets that, of course, all the performers are touching. So we are doing, creating um, a very, very precious fixed team or bubble for our performers. It's hidden away in the performing arts guidance. You have to hunt around for it, but it's in there for dancers and stage fighters that it's acknowledged that you have to touch each other. Um, and so we're basically the way we will deliver all of our work moving forwards is to maintain the kind of what we're good at, because as um, Philip has just shown, people are doing fantastic socially distanced work out there and it's just not we as, what we as a company do. So we've decided to take the alternative approach, which is to figure out how to protect our bubble so we can deliver our work. And we've been focusing on our delivery mechanisms around that in terms of risk assessments and how we'll work with our presenters to ensure that we are guaranteed COVID safe. You can still get the wow motion house experience, but there's going to be really kind of critical infrastructures in place to protect that bubble and for us to protect the tour. Um, I think something that plays to our strengths in terms of moving ahead is the fact that we have a really wide ranging repertoire from duets through to six and seven handers. So therefore we can respond to different opportunities of scale and price because price is absolutely going to be a factor which we're aware moving ahead. Um, but as far as today, I was particularly asked to talk a bit about our experience of performing outdoors. Um, at first sight, glance, as I said, you know, because of the nature of what we do, it's easy to assume that we are limited in how and where we can perform. But um, I'm really crap at screen sharing, but here we go. I hope it works all right. I'm about the least techno. Uh, no, it's not doing it. Oh, sorry. I don't know why it's not doing this. Hang on. It's not going to let me share. It's when you when you click screen share, what happens? I've got a screen with lots of exclamation marks on it. Oh, um, maybe someone more technical than me can help. Exclamation marks, that's beyond my pay grade. Yeah, sorry, folks. I've been practicing this, but for some reason, it's not going to let me do it. Well, you're just going to have to listen to me talk then. So sorry about that. I've got a lovely presentation lined up because I wanted to talk about um, two shows that we've done um, in the outdoors in the winter. One of them we did at Shakespeare's Birthplace Trust in December 2018. And over the course of a five day run of a show, we had everything from thick mud, ice, snow, rain, heavy wind, you name it, we had it. Every single performance, we had a different environmental massive issue to deal with. And I felt that that was just a really good kind of case study to talk about today. Sadly, you've got me talking rather than the visual aids. Um, but we learned a huge amount from that about how to not be precious about our material and how actually it is possible to adapt to almost any consideration. Now obviously health and safety is always behind absolutely everything. So my big takeaway from that was that anything 
I think actually in this country all year round you have to assume that you're going to face adverse weather and for our work there are some things we cannot do in heavy rain but we try and create our work in such a way that we can adapt so considerations for us as a company that work in physical contact and on structures for our sets are first of all we need to understand how our set behaves in different um, meteorological situations so whether or not the set's going to expand whether or not the joints are going to stiffen whether moving parts are going to stop moving or are going to move more than they should whether the set will expand whether it will shrink whether or not the flooring that we normally perform on is going to behave differently so in the case of our December project at, at um, Shakespeare's Birthplace Trust, we took, had with us Hessian flooring, tarpaulin, gymnastic mats, all sorts of things. We had squeegee mops, we had brushes, and basically we had a team of people who went out before every show and tried to create the best surface for us to be able to deliver our show. The performers were given time in order to go out and rework the choreography, so sticking to the sort of truth of the show, but adapting, so if things were gonna be slippery, to change what we were doing, maybe look at the footwear that they were wearing, but really, really critically before every show to go out and, and basically assess the conditions. And because of that, we were able to, produce, to perform, as I said, under virtually every conceivable winter condition. Now, obviously, we had to cut some bits, we expanded other bits. So built into the creation of the show was a really kind of thorough understanding of what was the key kind of messaging, what was the key content we wanted to get over and how to vary that in line with the situation that we found ourselves in. Another big takeaway for us, which we learned actually many years ago when we opened um, part of the bull ring with a big event with JCB Diggers and Dancers back in November 2011, um, late November, very, very cold. Dancers were dancing, hanging off JCB diggers on a concrete floor in the winter. Again, you know, it sounds like a recipe for disaster. But once again, what we looked at was, you know, movement of, of the vehicles, how the dancers traversed through the show, and really, really critically, how their bodies and their costumes interacted with, in that case, JCBs, but equally transferable to sets if we were in the Shakespeare project, looking at the soles of the footwear, you know, whether a rubberized footwear, making sure footwear wasn't transferring dirt or ice from outside the performing area into the performing area, so laying trackways so there was a safe entry to the outdoor environment they were performing in. And really, really importantly, and kind of obviously clothing, so layers of thermals, costuming in puffer jackets, making sure that they could wear cycle gloves, grippy gloves, so that they can hang on to things. It all sounds incredibly obvious, but it's amazing to me that these things, people don't tend to think of these things. Other considerations for outdoor performing in winter is to think about the comfort of your audience, um, obviously and make sure that with social distancing, this isn't an issue anyway, but in normal times, making sure that people can put umbrellas up without poking each other's in the eye, making sure that there's sort of hot chocolate for sale nearby so that they're warm and then, you know, they can hold that in their hands and, and you know, ensure that they are having a kind of relatively comfortable time. But also performers, making sure backstage you've got hot water bottles. There's rarely heaters in a lot of these places, but hot water bottles, kettles, hot drinks, blankets. So that around the performance itself, you're kind of looking at the, the comfort and experience of the journey through it for performers and for audiences. Um, I think without my, let me just quick, I can see my presentation. Let me just see if I've missed anything of my takeaways. I'm really sorry that you couldn't get to see my um, presentation itself. Um, yeah, oh, and maintenance. Um, as I mentioned earlier, think about how the set's gonna behave, build in that time before the performances, go out before every show, no matter what, even if climactically you think it's the same as the one you just did. Be prepared to scrub the floor, change the material, test the set, sweep, dry, you name it. We were even having to do that during the show. We had to adapt the action at, um, on at least two of the performances in Stratford so that, the, so that as the performers moved through from one section of the show to another, people were behind them sorting out the flooring so the next bit of action could be safe. I think the thing that we've learned is it's better to show all that. Don't feel you have to hide it. In an outdoor context, 
um, everything is highly visible. So work with that. We found we, the, the audience were really on board with us. We got an incredible response and um, it really proved to us, having been quite nervous and skeptical about our ability to deliver come what may, that it is doable, it is possible, and just go in there and um, think through absolutely everything. Um, nothing is too silly to consider. Oh, Louise, thanks so much. I'm sorry you had that horrible exclamation mark experience. If you um, would you be willing to share your presentation with people as a file? Yeah, absolutely, good idea. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you, and um, please listen. Uh, Louise has got um, an amazing wealth of experience in uh, presenting highly physical work outdoors. So please ask questions. This is your chance, and she will answer them when she shared her file. Thanks, Louise. So next is um, Chris and Caroline. Can I hand over to you? Yeah. Hello everybody, is that loaded okay? So uh, yeah, me and Chris are doing a double act today. We've worked together on a, um, a number of um, events. Uh, really, you should have John Adkins from JA Productions, um, but we've decided that together we're just as good as he is as um, one. If not, if not better. <laughs> um, but I think the really interesting thing with this is that actually, um, we quite regularly, when we're um, putting events together, work as, a, as, a, as, as three when we're actually designing events from the beginning. So I, I just wanted to pick up on a couple of things that um, were said by some of the other, this, other speakers before starting. Um, but I'm kind of amazed actually, as amazing as Greenwich and Docklands International Festival is, that they haven't had an independent um, safety consultant um, yeah. as part of their event previously because I mean we've we've been doing that for major events such as weekend for the, the last few years and I think that in the context of what you've asked us to speak on today in terms of um, providing reassurance um, for decision makers um, you know that is a big part of, 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 of doing that and probably will be um, you know going forward so understandable why they're, they're kind of doing that um, now. Um, the other thing is that I just wanted to pick up um, was that um, my company, Outdoor Places Unusual Spaces, um, Opus, um, work in a range of different settings. And I think it's really useful when hearing the case studies today to approach them, um, thinking about how you are entering different spaces and potentially therefore different rules and etiquettes. So a bit like how Matt was talking about the rules and regulations the bull ring um, which we've worked with previously they have different rules to for example um, network rail if that's the ground floor space of um, you know Birmingham New Street etc and so getting your head into that mentality of kind of entering other people's houses and there being different rules and therefore potentially additional and different costs which is something we're going to touch on now I think is a useful thing to have at the forefront of your mind when um, planning for um, this, uh, these sorts of events. So those were just a couple of things from that. In terms of what we're going to cover today, um, Chris, who is from Logical Safety Solutions, um, is going to talk a bit about what a health and safety consultant does. Um, you know, what do I, as an event producer, essentially pay him to do? Why do I bring him into these projects and what additionality and benefit is he bring in? And we're going to particularly talk about um, the CBSO's 100th birthday celebrations, which you might call a digital event. That was a live stream event, um, but we used a private warehouse. We were using the, their indoor space, a bit of their outdoor space. And so in that respect, me and Arik concurred that it classed as a sort of site specific event and, and, and therefore there was still going to be useful learnings about gathering um 80 plus musicians and staff um you know as a case study for things that you might be able to um learn um and so yeah i guess that um just before i hand over to chris talking about what a health and safety consultant might do i guess if some of you are approaching this either from an indoor venue or or smaller companies where you do all of the work or an operations um manager does this sort of work it's not unusual actually in an outdoor setting to bring an independent health and safety consultant um, in and they can be involved in um, all different stages including the safety advisory group stage which is 
something that we've been having a bit of chat about. Um, but they do give um, real good visibility and safety eyes onto things that as a producer, you might be thinking in one particular certain way when you're setting up your box office system, for example. And so actually having a safety voice in the planning process can be really valuable. So just an example of that is when we've been planning things like concerts in the park, in Sutton Park, Chris had some input into the way that we were designing the ticketing and that actually really helped us because we ensured that we had some age specific tickets which really helped us with our lost child policy and how many people for that that we might have on site. So things that as a producer you might be thinking about the ticketing experience from one point of view, a health and safety consultant might be looking at them in a, a different way and, and how they can kind of add value to the um, safety planning of the event. But I will hand over to Chris on um, what uh, a health and safety consultant does. Thanks very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I suppose I should start with who am I and, and, and why I'm in this role. Just so you're aware, I'm, I'm currently working on London Marathon, which, fingers crossed, will happen as an elite biosphere bubble uh, multi-marathon event next weekend. I normally work on, on that every year. Currently just finished also working on the, the Newcastle Live Outdoor Arena in part and now looking, believe it or not, at Christmas parties, outdoor Christmas parties and events while everyone raises their eyebrows in these current climates. Because I've got this philosophy that everything, absolutely everything is possible. It's Everything's doable. It depends to what level. Louise made some really great points about the health and safety being sort of all-encompassing. But actually what Louise has done, and, and, and from what I heard there, was a lot of common sense measures that go in and just a little bit of clear thinking. And that's what I do. I bring along a little bit of clear thinking. I, I do sit on two safety advisory groups nationally. I sit on the London National Safety Advisory Group and I sit on the National Safety Advisory Group advisory body. And I've currently spent three months also working with Public Health England in London to try and unravel um, some of the myriad of, of decisions. And I think at the moment, the, the challenge for all of you guys, especially in the arts, well, anyone doing outdoor events, is, is not that there isn't guidance out there. It, there's probably too much. And there's probably too much conflicting guidance from very, very many organizations and associations. And I look at the performing arts world when I had this, this guidance slammed at me last week by Public Health England in relation to a sport, a mass sporting event we were doing. And I had to say, well, that's performing arts. This is mass sport. But actually, there was some relevance and crossover. So there's a lot of that. There's a lot of research we do. We do. There's a lot of, of, of digging and delving and picking up on things that, that people have made before. There's also a lot looking at the legalities and the competency certainly at the current moment, into COVID marshals and COVID coordinators and COVID supervisors. Some industries are forced down this route at the moment and some want them voluntarily. Filming and advertising is one that has to has them. So we'll look at everything for everybody. From the designs, your plans, not only in transport and crowd management, with risk assessments, the whole safety advisory group advi process, um, as Caroline mentioned, ticketing, box office, but we, we try to take it even further than that sometimes, what we would call the last mile me methodology in where ultimately your audience are going to come from and how they're going to move. So important on the outdoor event scene and so important on the when you've got potential of adverse weather because there's so much more you might have to do. There's a lot of planning before and we try and do 99% of our work um, before the event. Um, because normally if we get to the event and, and there's something we haven't considered, we've, 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 we've probably failed. So it's, it's making sure before the event that all those plans and contingencies and what ifs are in place, the training is in place, everybody has been briefed, everybody knows what to do, where to go and how to do it. And very importantly, on top of our list, it's absolutely top of our list nationally to help you guys, to help organisers, is your contractors and suppliers because we, we we tend to find from a legal point of view and a competency point of view you work your socks off you plan for months 
you do everything in your power and you can be let down very badly um, by one supplier or, or one contractor who maybe doesn't, in, in investigation later on, doesn't make the grade. Um, and that's really important at the moment, especially with COVID, just to put some pressure on at times to make sure actually what they're producing isn't what they were producing in writing 18 months ago. As I, I found out this morning, unfortunately, from a national marquee company who has not one word of COVID or infectious control in any of their paperwork. That leaves you liable as, as the organiser and the person contracting them. So that's our, that's our job, to watch your back and to, and to sort that out. Obviously, afterwards, debriefing, learning all the way, and that's the positive thing. If any can be brought out of the current situation, we're all learning. I'm learning, and, and the ethos is to pass on that knowledge as much as possible. So looking specifically at this one, it, a lot of the elements into the CBSO 100th birthday from a safety point of view were, were exactly the same as you'd imply for an outdoor. Looking at the social distancing backstage, what you can't see is what you can see directly in front of you was, was the violins, the violas and the cellos off to the left. Round the corner in the same amount of space, also separated, was all the rest of the instruments. And please don't ask me to name what all the instruments are. <laughs> I met them all every day, but I still don't know. On the right is, is, was the entrance where they came in, which was a form of COVID declaration, which is really important to get the medical questions from people who are working for you at the moment. Are they currently waiting for a test? Well, if they are and they haven't had a result, there's a question mark about whether that then compromises your event should they receive the test. Have they been in contact? Have they been following the guidelines? So they, they go through that process in advance then they're having a temperature check. It does very look much, very Japanese with all the bowing into the machines, but you could use your wrist or your forehead. And a lot of people preferred, preferred that way, especially most of the musicians because they're carrying instruments and do not hand them over to anybody. So there's a process of temperature checking. That is the major reassurance part. It's not a medical thing. It's, it, it means nothing. And um, we have to be honest about that. It's for reassurance, and the reassurance at the moment is the greatest tool we have, um, and it's, it's the greatest emphasis in everything we're doing. So as part of that process, yes, there's, there's risk assessments. Included in that is COVID risk assessments. As, you'll find, as you've seen from yesterday's uh, briefing, now a, a huge emphasis on those being legal requirements. So that's, that's quite important for everybody. Safety planning, all the what ifs, um, the emergency planning, the evacuation planning. It might be a pre-existing warehouse, but we're, we're changing its use. So we have to look at, are we blocking exits off by doing what we're doing? Are we changing the fire rating and the risk with inside? Even outside, we'd do the same. The contractor diligence again. Being there to support and advise. Someone's put their sharing risk assessments. It's, it's actually a legal requirement. You've got to show everybody who's affected your risk assessments. It's really important. Without them, there's, there's, there's no point doing them. Social distancing guidelines, as, as we all know, temperature checking, inductions and briefings. Again, no point putting it all in place if you don't tell everybody. Air quality consultation. This was fascinating. This came from the Musicians Union. Um, because we CBSO were wonderful. CBSO safety personnel and the operations team stood there and scratched their heads with me and the best of them and we all went what do we need to do we we all get we need to circulate some air can we just put roller shutters up can we open windows no we have to bring in an expert who says this is what you need so that's put in place so we've got fresh air circulation massive reassurance for the orchestra huge reassurance they wanted to come back every day okay carolyn yeah, I just want to say it's a good job that um, you couldn't see that in shot for the final uh, yeah. <laughs> digital live stream. But I guess what um, what we're really sort of getting at here is that welfare is fundamentally what you've really got to think about when you're in the outdoors. There are things that are just not yeah. provided in or you know catered for in a typical setup. And actually, even with this sort of hybrid where we're ap operating within a building where you might think that all of this is... Um, you know, provided for you, we have had to advise the client, i.e. the CBSO on this occasion, that they might require to spend extra money. So we actually bought in additional toilets. 
the toilets weren't going to be sufficient for them to be able to social distance and use them within the music break times. You know, it was just what was in the site for the standard PRG staff, the venue that we were using. Those are the same considerations that you would have if you were on a greenfield site. You cannot just rock up. You cannot have a security guard there um, overnight and not have facilities for him or her to be able to use for, um, you know, welfare. So, you know, similar to what Louise was saying about welfare, you know, about temperature, about keeping people warm and everything, those are the sorts of, you know, budget lines that you, you, you really need to um, consider. The other thing that I wanted to say is that despite all of this, and there were obviously lots of additional layers, everything took longer, lots of conversations about how we were going to do things. Um, you know, we did still manage to have fun, like, like Rosie said, and, you know, we agonized over how we're going to get, you know, masks were on, this is performance day, we allowed people to not have masks on, but, you know, they were all led on on a, a, a you know, it was all very heavily kind of choreographed, but ultimately, the musicians still had an absolutely fabulous time managing to perform and what we think is the largest gathering of musicians because the proms didn't have as many people um, on stage as we managed to kind of have um, for this. Um, and I, I, you know, I do take that with me despite all of the stresses of getting there and that seems to be what everyone's sort of saying. Um, it was absolutely worth it and, and, and it's nice to see a smiling face there. Um, I think the other thing that me and Chris wanted to mention was um, about what you have to do in the moment when you're perhaps facing a challenging issue. So we had a moment where our presenter was um, running a little bit late. We're obviously rolling, needed to very quickly get him on stage. At the moment, the guidance tells you that production staff are not able to fix microphones to people. Um, this was a very like intense moment, but we just said, put your mask on, sanitize hands and assist because actually there's no way that if you saw Adrian in his very swanky three piece suit, that he would have managed to have got that radio in between wound up and, and threw it on himself, even with a great deal of time to prepare, let alone under conditions. So, you know, I think it's just worth for anyone else that's kind of holding that risk and that producing job to sort of have conversations with each other and say, you know, okay, well, we, we, you know, that does happen and you just have to make a call. And I literally stood over them like a mom and made sure they sanitized their hands um, afterwards because that was what was needed to kind of make that happen. Thank you. We all need to be you know, aware of those things as well. Caroline, you done? Yeah, yeah, I think that's probably our time, isn't it, Orit? <laughs> it is, yeah. Thank you very, very much, Chris and Caroline. That's so informative. Um, really appreciate uh, everything that you've shared with us. If you have questions for uh, Chris or Caroline, write them in the chat. And um, I'm really delighted uh, to now introduce um, Gemma from Appetite and Stoke and Richard from Stoke City Centre bid. It was definitely something that came up in our last meeting was what's the bids perspective? What do uh, city centres, town centres, retail sector, what, what, what do you want from the culture sector at this moment? So it'd be great to hear what you're planning in Stoke and to get your perspective over to you. Okay, so I'm gonna go first. Um, Rick and Rich is our partner in the work that we do in the city centre. Um, Okay, so I'm the director of Appetite, it's a Creative People and Places programme in Stoke and for um, Newcastle Underline. And I'm a member of Without Walls, which is a network of commissioning and touring at Blue Arts for England as a touring part of, partner, but also as a trustee. Um, our plans for this winter and autumn season are to try and do something. There must be something that we can do, is how I felt about um, summer <laughs> and winter and, and this whole time that this is going on. So we usually run a summer event, the big feast together. Lots of our work has been, um, lots of our work is, work, we work with local people as decision makers on the programme, partners, including Richard and the city centre bid, but also the local authority and others to design something that could work with 
the evolving government guidance which you have heard from everybody else um, so what am I thinking about with the team what are the differences now I thought I would cover so things that we for what we are planning um, it's a movable feast we're calling them seasonal specials so that they can be anywhere <laughs> um, so the COVID measures have to be considered up front with the artistic programme and shape the activity based on the scenarios. So conversations all the time about what can we do, whatever the scenario. Um, flexible contracting of artists and suppliers, so checking in with them about what their approaches would be, whatever the scenario. Um, restrictions, changes, suitability for work if it's going from seasons. Um, we're considering of live streaming for people who can't get to events and if it changes within 24 hours so that actually we can still do something and share our work. Um, so we're doing exhibitions. We're having a month long ex outdoor exhibition which is illuminated at night um, and people will have messaging about touching, it'll be cleaned regularly and people will be able to see each other because they're big cubes so have, don't have to go in like a room um, we are doing installations so there's no set times for people to gather to avoid lapses in social distancing we'd like we want to do performances so performances of various scales what's brilliant about outdoor work is that they can happen at repeated times throughout the day so you can manage um, people in but we have in the past also done more arena type events so how can we use that learning for arena type events for uh, street events so ticketing track and trace um, as the hippodrome we're talking about um, about pop-up so we are considering doing more broadly for our program pop-ups um, activity in locations that can help us achieve our aims of reaching people who don't usually engage in the arts but also looking at other sectors advice for projects so retail and hospitality as the chat's been saying um, there are things that because that is more familiar to people and it's been ongoing actually how can we talk about our approach in uh, language of using the spacing of tables if you're creating uh, specific bubbles of pods for people to watch performance how, how can you use that that's really useful um, and also we might because of the weather and thinking about the weather we might use some uh, in venue so big spaces as, as Caroline not quite a warehouse but how can we use the in venue um, guidance but also there's the new QR codes for NHS track and trace um, we might start to, because businesses are, are starting to use that, how can we have that in our programme so people, if they're there, can start to, sc to scan in to say that they're there. Um, other differences, we'd usually create and maintain with local authorities that relate to our in regular meetings with the culture team, but also for safety advisory, tourism, culture, highways. But for COVID, there is a new set of stakeholders to prove and establish your track record of delivering safe events with. Um, we've had to pull an event, which was supposed to be happening next weekend. Um, we pulled it earlier because um, it's just taking a lot of time because it's being reviewed by public health through scrutiny. And it's when the rule of six came in. Um, so we're having to talk about our um, approach to COVID before we're talking about the uh, approach to the overall safety of the event. Um, that's what they want to know first before we actually do the risk assessment for the, for the event. Um, and we are considering how we are approaching safety of our team, our volunteers, the public, and then team I, I'm adding in artists, suppliers, everybody. Um, time i've just said time it takes a lot of time to make decisions um, and people are not wanting to make a decision on what we're doing because often the people we're working with are dealing with the public health emergency um, and it's a roller coaster um, everyone is undergoing these shifting sands um, so people's mental health personal circumstances and trying still to make art happen is really important and i do think um, there is opportunity to do it and I think we're going to do our we're going to be completely flexible all the time but now I'm going to hand over to Rich because he's more interesting than me around what bids want in terms of city centre 
Thanks very much. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, perfect. Okay, that's excellent. Um, okay, so uh, Richard Buxton from Stoke-on-Trent City Centre Bid. Um, I'm assuming that everyone is pretty much aware of what bids do, but very quickly, there's over 300 of us uh, bids around the country. Um, Stoke-on-Trent City Centre Bid's been going for about two years now, just coming up to two years. Um, and we, we've done quite a lot of really good work, particularly with uh, arts and events uh, over the last over the last two years. Um, we had a major sort of projects uh, planned for this summer, uh, sometime around I don't know what it was, March the seventeenth. I walked into the office, ripped off the paperwork from the wall, which had everything planned, and started to uh, start again. Um, the basics of what we do as a bid has not uh, changed through any, uh, through any of this. We, we're still about pushing footfall wherever we can. Um, events in the city centre uh, that are free to the public, and we're still here to uh, change perceptions. It was a particularly big thing here in Stoke-on-Trent. Um, we were the uh, we were known as the home of Brexit. Unfortunately, uh, we're now uh, changing those things uh, around and working with people like uh, Gemma from Appetite, um, where we're making really good inroads. I think what I need to um, point out is probably a few obvious things to everyone uh, again, but where we are as a bid, we, we get our levy income from our um, uh, businesses that they, 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 they pay us. Um, most of one half of my life seems to be one longer risk assessment at the on one side and the other half seems to be uh cash flows and looking where we are um all bids collect their money at different times of the year um now we would normally expect to for example have in the first three months of our collections uh get about 70 percent of the money in that we get uh in the next uh three months about 20 percent since um, March, bids that have started to go into their collection cycle have been at around 30 to 60% instead of 70 in those first three months and 50 to 70%. What that means is as bids, we've got less money. Um, but from the things that we've spoken about today, we can see that um, many of much of the work that you guys do has got in, um, increased costs to it with with looking into those real extra safety measures and so on so we always have to um, bear that in mind when when you're coming to people like bids whoever to put events on um, be as inventive as you can uh, with 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 what you've got um, we don't expect anyone to be dropping prices or anything like that well certainly this bid doesn't we um, we know how much things cost but we are looking at the really sort of inventive um, uh, uh, products to put onto the streets which will continue to uh, to get that footfall going um, so that flexibility I think is 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 really important obviously you guys know that we can't have lots of crowds standing around in one place so uh, moving performance is, is very important that's what we're working with uh, Gemma Appetite with at the moment um, the other thing you'll get more prob probably probably you you will get interference from local authorities anyway with regards to SAG meetings and so on. Um, bids tend to like to, um, you come in, you, you sell us an idea, and then we go, yes, let's do it, and we put the finance in place. Unfortunately, we will become like the nagging mother along with the council at the moment because the council are nagging us. Uh, quite a lot so we will be asking about social distancing measures we will be really looking into the risk assessments ourselves uh, along with the local authorities because at the end of the day it, it's a reflection a reflection of us um, we have to be very careful um, about public uh, concerns now as well. Uh, it used to be as the public, you know, you, you guys would pitch up in, in a town centre put on an amazing event, the public would love it, and you never know, it may get onto some of these god-awful social media groups who do nothing but complain and say something was good. At the moment, they like to look back at those things that they can complain about. So the more we can make that social distancing and make it look uh, that we are putting in the real work and you guys are putting in the work, uh, it is obviously important. Um, what's also strangely important is that that has to, from our point of view, has to pass on to the businesses. Um, 
I noticed that someone was saying earlier that one of the things that came up in a SAG group was not to promote the events. Now, from a bid point of view, that seems incredibly strange. I can understand why, I guess, but it seems very strange for me as a bid. But we were putting, we've been putting music on since the businesses reopened, the hospitality. Um, but it did actually get to the point where the music was becoming so popular that we were getting too many people in the street. Uh, so we had to review how we were doing that. Um, so th there is that almost that thought process from our point of view is we want lots of people there. We just want to make sure again that everything is done in the correct way. Whereas in the past we would be trusting that you guys would all do that, and we're sure you are now. It's just as we'll be we'll be checking much much more than perhaps we did in the past. We do have things planned for this year. Obviously, with Appetite, we should have had the big feast. Uh, we're looking how we're going to do that over a couple of weekends in October uh, uh, and November. We have to check, obviously, again, with, with the performers and, uh, and Appetite do this for us uh, on flexibility because who knows, I hear about circuit breaks and lock, local lockdowns and so on, which we could end up in. Um, I think if I was going to give any... Um, the main bit of advice that I would give at the moment is to get your local cabinet members on side at the council. If you're dealing with the council and you can get that cabinet, whoever is the cabinet member with responsibility on side, that will go a long way to help. They, they are obviously concerned about the, um, the social distancing and all of that, but they very much want to promote their city centre through the art, through the arts here in Stoke. Um, our cabinet members have been very supportive of what we've been doing. Um, we had an event last weekend, which was called um, Every Other Seat, which was a small art uh, event in the street. And we've got uh, Jimmy Culty's uh, estate um, project this weekend uh, coming. Um, obviously, everything's been organised very differently than it would have been 12 months ago with regards to track and trace and ticketing and so on. Um, but these things can be done. Um, and I think as a the biggest positive I can give is that bids really do want to do things in the city centre. It's it's a major part of what we what we do, um, and nothing's changed with that. So uh, the more you guys are doing out there, um, please let us know. And if you need any contacts within bids, um, again, let me know in particular areas. Um, we've got uh, good relationships across the sort of of all the bids. Uh, I usually know who the manager is. Um, so yeah, um, just keep doing what you're doing, guys. Just do it in uh, an even safer way than before. Oh, thanks so much, Richard. Thank you, um, Richard and Gemma. That was really um, very, very useful to hear your perspectives. Um, well, we're nearly at the end of our um, uh, amassed presentations, um, and it would be great to. We've got some time to respond to any questions that you might have. So if you have a question, you could write it that hasn't been answered yet. If you write it in the chat, then um, I can address it to um, to the to everyone to see who can answer it. And while you're thinking about that, I just wanted to jump in with um, some questions that came through from last time to let you know how um, Ellie from Greenwich and Docklands Festival res uh, um, responded. On the question of ticketing, um, she said that um, Greenwich and Docklands Festival, which is normally a free outdoor arts festival, the ticketing was new for them and uh, Eventbrite was recommended because of uh, the, the high quality user interface. Um, they communicated a lot of information to people who booked through that and they found it useful. She said that the beauty of ticketing um, is that it really helps with uh, test and trace you know who's coming, but it can be a barrier for local audiences. So they also used QR codes for walk-ups um, to ensure that local people were still able to attend. Um, they also uh, investigated a different range of sites this time. They took work to small, they took smaller scale work to local sites like basketball um, courts where there are not, where there isn't high footfall. So prominent in a neighborhood, highly local, hyper-local, but not with loads of passing trade where you have to negotiate them too. And I thought that was a useful tip. I asked them about live streaming and how they had decided to approach that. Um, and uh, Ellie said, well, you, well, they really had to interrogate what was the point. Was the point for them to enable larger audiences? 
or to capture a quality of experience for audiences. They decided that live streaming at the quality end was um, too expensive given the risks. Um, uh, the risks of weather, the risks of wind, the risks of simply not being able to provide a high quality live stream experience given what working outdoors is like. So these were no not bad. COVID risks. No. These were, um, yeah, these were the risks just that come with being outdoors. So they decided to use a digital capture approach. They filmed everything. They used at least two cameras to film it and they edited it fast and put it up on social media a few hours later. So they prioritized the high quality um, experience, but they, and the price they paid was that it wasn't live live, it was later live. And, uh, and that they, for where, where they felt that they just wanted to reach an uh, the largest possible audience and they weren't bothered about quality, then they used Instagram or Facebook Live. So in terms of the lower cost, more affordable end of live streaming, that was how, um, that was what Ellie shared from Greenwich and Docklands Festival. And I also asked what were the budget lines where you spent more money and how did you manage that? And she shared with us, I think that this is just adding to what's already been said, um, cleaning, yes, signage, they had clear messaging on site, on every single site, and they spent a lot more on signage than they ever, ever have before. They made pre-show announcements and post-show announcements about everything, and they really carefully worked on the tone. So I was thinking, Matt, when you shared the image of the lifeguards, um, that, that perhaps could be helpful um, as a way of thinking about how to communicate warmly and humorously um, with your public in the moment about safety. Um, and um, in terms of audiences, uh, it I quote, it was much more successful than I would have dreamed of. As you all said, the feedback from audiences was incredibly positive. People were deeply grateful for the opportunity to come and see work. And when I asked what was the buzz like, so, you know, what was the kind of quality of experience Ellie said that the buzz was affected much more by location than by social distancing. So the new sites that they tried out, some of them were just not so warm uh, and, uh, and, and, and the context for the audience was just not quite so convivial and maybe just the audience weren't that chirpy on that day or that noisy, but she felt that the social distancing did not affect the buzz of the experience. So I just wanted to, um, to share those uh, those points from a very very warm and leaning in Greenwich and Docklands International Festival, and hopefully we can invite them to come and speak for themselves. Um, I'm going to look to see who's asked a question. Rosie, you've got a question. Do you want to say it out loud, and then uh, whoever feels that they can usefully answer it, if you can um, unmute yourself and answer, that would be great. Um, Rosie, thank you. I just have a question um, for the floor. I don't know who feels they can answer this, but about sustainability. So in terms of increased signage, potentially using disposable items, lots of more cleaning materials, um, whether anyone has any views on how to say sustainable while still being compliant. Mm, anyone got any answers to that? Have a dig. Chris, go for it. A really good one, Rosie. It's something we keep looking at all the time and still looking at. A lot of the bamboo replacement products have come in and are now being used. And what, what we've also looked at is not just sustainability, I suppose, it's the environmental impact, is reusing. It's, it's literally reusing everything. Um, there is going to be more of it, and we want to try and reduce the paper, obviously. We want to try and reduce the printing. Um, and the other one is trying to be more creative with the signage. Uh, does it have to be written? Can it be illuminated? Can it be something that, 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 that's somewhere out the box? Um, and we've, we've looked at that as well. The other one on the signage and the communication, especially in COVID, is probably not it looking at not using signs, but using people. Um, putting people in place to reduce the signage, but to add that one-to-one -one communication. Street wardens, as an example, street guides, if that helps. Because I've got no other answer. <laughs> That's really helpful. Thanks, Chris. Um, Erica, would you like to just talk about the audience survey um, that you posted a link to, just to give a little snapshot of that? I'm on mute, sorry. I was, I was, I was just realising that um, 
that, that it was probably quite useful in terms of when you mentioned about audiences. So Indigo and Outdoor Arts um, UK worked together to do a survey of audiences around getting back to and what the attitudes were for, for outdoors. So it's got some really great summaries in there. I think it got a summary from about 6,000 um, people um, to ask them about what their attitudes were. I'm going to try and it's got lots and lots of information in. So um, I think it's the idea of they want people want to get back to outdoor events and um, but they definitely want to see safety. So it's about the confidence um, and wanting to go but yeah not having crowds, making sure that safety measures are in place and knowing what they were and enforced as well. Those seems to be and people were happy to travel um, to different things. Um, actually um, in this one people are very happy to pay for outdoor events as well which I think um, considering normally that that isn't a, um, for outdoor, normally they are often free. Um, and what they're most looking forward to, there we go. So the buzz of being at a live event, supporting local festivals, venues or events, a casual and relaxed nature of outdoor events, being part of a community um, and just getting back outdoors. So, you know, if people do want it. I think it's just how we do that safely um, is the thing. And I think we can get that across then. I think we've got that. Yeah, Auric, right. can I add to that? I think our experience with Walk With Me really reflects that. And um, people were clearly very happy to be there. And um, one of the things I noticed was uh, some people who were friends had booked onto the same tour. So it was something they could do safely together. Perhaps people, uh, this is just a supposition, but it, a group of slightly older people who maybe didn't feel comfortable to go to a restaurant or a cafe and sit around in that way, but to walk around and be able to talk to each other but still have some distance we also had a couple of larger family groups one which was more than six so we asked them just as they walked around to make sure they were not in a group of more than six at any time people were really happy to do that most people wore masks without us asking we had invited them to in our email that we'd sent beforehand but we didn't at any point ask people to do it or insist and in fact somebody said oh i didn't think about bringing a mask and one, someone else who didn't know said oh i've got a spare one if you want you know so that was kind of happening um, in terms of sustainability, we made our masks that were that a washable three layer with a non-woven uh, bit in the middle that we can reuse. Um, we use chalkboards for signage. Now, uh, we were obviously doing this on quite a smaller scale and I'm conscious in, in comparison to some of the other speakers, what we were doing was quite small scale, but that might be relevant to people here. And we were doing this at Fargo Village. So they had plenty of signage. So we didn't need to add to that signage. The mm -hmm. signage as you came into the village was there. Hand sanitizer was there. Um, so that people were doing that as they came in. One thing we were quite conscious about, I said that we were sanitized. So we, we always have um, fabric covers on the headphones anyway that we change every time. But in addition, we used a spray and, and, and paper towel to clean those off after every use and then put them aside and use a different lot for the next two and then they sat overnight. But we were very conscious about an antiseptic kind of smell on that. We got a very nice, um, uh, uh, other products do exist but method rhubarb smelling one which was a much better thing to have on your headphones than having like dental smell I, I, I'll have to look into how <laughs> effective that is in comparison to dental but um, you know I, so I think making some small changes you can still uh, sustainability is really Im important to us um, uh, so we, we, we just try to manage that within the context of what we were doing thanks Philippa Carol you have a question um, yeah, I was just actually just as a really general observation, thinking for particularly for the work that we've done in Leamington with our bid, um, is actually where does the element of spontaneity come in? Because we're looking at sort of at the most low cost ability and supporting of musicians to get them out and about playing in the town. But then it of course the whole issue of you can't have something with how many people stop or, or or the barriers you put up or how you actually have that level of spontaneity or pop-up theatre without having to be completely pre-booked COVID testing. It's an interesting balance. I just wondered if anybody had done that. Anyone want to respond, Rosie? Um, just about your musicians. So I recently organised some busking um, on my local high street where um, obviously we were, it was spontaneous, there was no um, ticketing. Um, and we just ensured we had, um, we, we were called them volunteers, but actually they were a COVID marshal um, with them. So they could stop the show or the music um, if crowds were gathering. But actually, um, one of the things we did is we had three musicians in different locations to encourage people to move on and not to stay still. But actually, we didn't have any issues with um, crowds gathering. Um, everyone who did stop was very respectful of social distancing and we had signage and hand sanitizer mm -hmm. 
available, but it, I just want to say it's, it's totally doable. Um, but something like having COVID marshal in place can kind of solve that for you. Thanks, Rosie. Caroline, you wanted to jump in. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, we, I, I, know, I know we're trying to be really positive in this, but there have also been instances of where this hasn't worked um, with like the ballet doing their open rehearsals in London, if anyone saw that. And actually the police did come and um, uh, dispersed audiences because um, they felt that it was creating a gathering and so there is that balance that we we need to strike in terms of the your legal responsibility and, and the knock-on kind of implications if you aren't able to manage like you, you know if you if, if it does become very popular and that might be worth just having a look at as well carol I, if i if i could add on if yeah if i wouldn't if i could add on to that um i, I mean i've heard the the word used about five or six times this afternoon and that's covid marshall we need to be you guys need to be really, really careful on the legalities of this and what it's not what you're called, it's what that role and responsibility is. If, if you're there to stop and potentially, uh, and, and there might be somewhere in your mind there would be some conflict, you're, you're looking into licensing security roles, not, not marshalling duties. You're also potentially crossing the line on the medical side and medical advice and medical guidance which, which I, I wouldn't do that, um, we go to a medic. I think you need to be very, very, very careful what, what someone put on before about perception. And it is about perception. If you're going to stick COVID marshal on the back of a jacket, then the public are going to expect that person to have a, a, a competent level of knowledge on the COVID virus and what it needs and what the advice and guidance is given. I know it's semantics, but it's protection for yourself. Um, I'd be very, very careful. It is being looked at at the moment, um, and, and there will be a, a competent defined role under legislation as a COVID supervisor. Mm, thanks. Uh, could I just say something there? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, so from a bid point of view, um, here in Stoke, we, we, we are, I guess, uh, in a, when it comes to COVID marshals, we have absolutely no idea at this point what they actually are. Um, we heard the announcement along with everyone else, and I've seen them pop up in certain areas, um, but we haven't been given any advice, despite questions uh, to the local authority on what that's going to be, whether it's going to be a security role, a policing role, a local authority role. What we do have in Stoke, and most bids do, are bid ambassadors. Uh, some will call them bid rangers, uh, we call them street ambassadors. Um, we uh, all of those guys have had uh, as much training on uh, the advice that we can give them, shall we say, uh, uh, with regards to COVID. They're also uh, all for fully first aid uh, trained. Uh, when we've put music on in the city, and when I say music, we've basically had a a, a, a DJ playing. It, now this is not a two o'clock in the morning Glastonbury tent dj this it's very much music that people when they're walking around can hear and enjoy it's it's the sound levels that we've been told we can keep it at um and our marshals uh, sorry our ambassadors are there with um uh hand sanitizer uh, uh available if people need it uh, uh where the dj's playing um if people feel uncomfortable as they walk past we we've not had this with crowds but if they do we've had masks available to hand out um uh, from a box where we even though it's outside we've you know some people have said that they wanted a mask um in the city anyway so we've ha we've had them available to the public uh it was quite a big uh issue for us we've had uh two uh, uh black lives matter um events shall we say um in which uh the police were were there and the police requested we would be there and there were masks available on an outside event so the fact that there are things you can do but as it's chris quite rightly said it seems to be a bit of a a, a minefield at the moment and you, you have got to be very careful where where where, uh, where you're getting your advice from shall we say i suspect people like chris are the people to go to thank you Anyone else want to comment on anything that you've heard about so far? Any of the people who've made a presentation, do you want to add anything? Just unmute if you do. 
No, so maybe we're um, drawing to a natural close. And so this is, um, this is what I'd like to do. I'd like to signpost you to the outdooratsuk.org website where they have compiled the advice and resources from across the outdoor events uh, industry sector. So if you're looking for guidance, up-to-date guidance, I do believe that it's all there at that link, um, you know, from all the different worlds where people are thinking about this, um, gathering the intelligence. Um, we would really welcome your thoughts on or, or um, on any other themes that you would want to hear discussed in a future version of this event. So if there's anything that is really bothering you or that you really feel you don't understand well enough, whether that's at small scale level or large scale uh, events that are done for Tempe and events that are done for um, thousands, please write them here because that will help um, to shape uh, our thinking about the next event. And if there's anyone you particularly would like to hear uh, from um, in terms of their stories and what they can share, um, please write it here. And also if you could add any feedback that you have uh, um, about this um, conversation that we've had so far and the ways in which you think it could be useful to you, that would be great. Erica, is there anything that you'd like to add? No, just th thank you again for everybody who has spoken. You are all amazing. We have a region of unbelievable experts in um, outdoor arts and amazing arts, artist organisations. So um, it's just amazing that they're here that Brett Pasty. So thank you for being so generous with all of your time and thoughts and advice and support. We will get the webinar up on our um, YouTube. We've recorded it. I have let people know. It usually just um, highlights the speaker. And any notes will go up again and we'll send those round. We do have a little bit of a section on our website. It's not as comprehensive as Outdoor Arts, but there is some interesting stuff and these will be available so if anybody wants to see them. Um, but also, yeah, to have that feedback, I'll probably also send you a little feedback survey just to fill in so we can inform our future work. Um, but yeah, hopefully um, hopefully we will be able to maybe do another, something else as we, as we move forward. So. Um, and oh, and probably a little bit of a, a bit of a plug to sign up to our um, culture response unit newsletter, which comes out every Thursday, and you'll find out pretty much about everything that we are trying to do to support the sector across the region. Um, so. Thank you, everyone, and everyone who was yeah in the group. You can have a little stay behind with a bit of feedback. So that's it. Thank you and goodbye, everybody. Do unmute and say bye before you leave. It's very lovely to hear your voice. Bye. 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 Thanks. Bye. 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 <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Maybe this is the moment where we find out who's actually gone to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pop for a cup of tea. <laughs>